equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle. On the worksheet, do all of the assignment. Whoa, do all of it, except don't do number four at the end. It's a calculation. And I don't know, when I made this, I don't know why I put that one in there here. It kind of goes to another place. And even then, don't worry about it right now. You'll, you'll actually see the answer key to it later on at a later date. I, probably better not to even try it if you don't know how to do it yet. <clears throat> um, okay. Now, I can't, like, I cannot overdo it by saying this is a very important topic. You might say in some ways it's the most important one that we have on the AP exam because we're going to be spending the next, this chapter, and in your book, it's actually, starting with this chapter, it's four chapters in a row on equilibrium. Pretty amazing. A lot of stuff. So it is always a guaranteed question on, on the AP. And lately, they've been asking two of these on the AP. Like one a full question and maybe one just part of the question. You'll know what I mean about that later. One from each different chapters that were coming up. They pick two out of the out of the ones out of four types of equilibrium. They pick two of them usually on the AP now. It used to be just this one. Um, this is a uh, anyway. It's very important, and it's also the good news is it's pretty easy actually when you get down to it. When I think about the hardest math in this entire class, the whole year of AP. I think about chapter four, about doing some of those calculations with titrations and you know limiting reagent and you remember the ESP problems, things like that. Well, this is this is cakewalk compared to that. I mean, it's, when you, by the time you get through it, it's like this is not bad, easy stuff. Okay, and you'll see it um, like kind of like um, probably kinetics were pretty good. It's a really important chapter to do well on. Okay, um, that's enough of that. I had to say something because this is this is a, a chapter that really stands above all. Um, the notes that I gave here, I'm going to go through a lot right now, a lot, well, a lot in your notes section. But what, what do you really end up needing to put like on paper? Like what I'm, what I'm going to go through. What is it really important? That you, what are you going to ask me, Mr. Valla? What's going to be on the test? Well, you'll see. I'm going to try to focus more on that. So I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. You can read through it, but I'll, I'll mention to it. First, I want to start off with what is equilibrium. Okay. The um, let's see the dim, the definition down here at the bottom here under the, about the third third frame there it says chemical equilibrium a dynamic reaction system reaction system a dy dynamic means changing dynamic reaction system in which the concentrations of all reactants and products remain constant as a function of time hmm pretty interesting and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a moment and show you. But here, first, I'm going to start off. There were two scientists. One of them, I, I don't remember their names. You know what? I've got it written over here. They, they um, invented, well, invented. They discovered or credited for what's called the law of mass action. And you know what? I guess I don't have it with me. I thought I had it. I think I dropped my notes. Oh, yeah, it is. Cato Goldberg and Peter Waj. Waj. And it's actually in your notes when I think about it. It's in, later on it'll be in your notes. Uh oh. Got a lot of brightness there. Okay. Peter Waj and um Goldberg. Waj and Goldberg. The law of mass action. And let's what does it tell you? Well, I'm gonna give you an example that you might know this or you might be familiar. If not, you're gonna think, hey, that's pretty interesting science. I didn't know that. So watch this. Let's say you have a container of, that has it in ice and water together, a mixture of ice and water. So you have H2O solid, and you also have H2O liquid. Now, what's interesting is, in ice water, um, it would depend on your temperature, but if you're at a constant temperature of zero Celsius, and a pressure We'll just say standard pressure at one atmosphere. It's not going to be that big of a deal. We close this off. In these, in these, well, it is, it is important to know. These, this pressure, I shouldn't say not a big deal. This pressure, this temperature. You probably know that water will, ice, ice will melt at zero Celsius if it's one atmosphere pressure. Water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius if it's one atmospheric pressure. Zero is the melting point and the freezing point. Well, in your freezer, you have ice. You don't have ice water because your, your freezer is colder than, than zero. If you put any water in the freezer, it's going to freeze to ice because it's like negative something in your freezer. 
But if you could adjust your freezer to be exactly zero in one atmosphere, guess what? You'd actually have this slushy ice, ice and water mixture. And there's something interesting about that mixture I want to show you. So you would have, at that temperature, some of the ice, every moment, some ice would molecules would break off into the, and, and into the liquid state. So some of the ice will melt to liquid. But at the same time, some of the water will refreeze onto the ice. So that's what this double arrow means. Some people draw it this way, two arrows. But most of the time, and including the AP, they do a half arrow up and down. It's actually easier to draw it that way. And what it means is you have two reactions going on. Ice is turning, is melting to water, and water is turning into ice, melt, freezing into ice. And it happens at the same rate. In equilibrium, these two reactions occur at equal, equal rates. The rate is what's equal in equilibrium. Only the rate is exactly equal. The, the kinetics, the first four, the forward reaction rate and the backward reaction, exactly the same. Um, let me think of another way to put it. It's like saying that um, I once said, like, or just say if we, if we fill this people, this room up with people in this room, and then just say that out in the hallway, there you also fill that up with people. So say if you're in the room, you're a liquid. If you're outside the room, you're a gas. Okay. I can do it that way, or I can make it solid liquid. It doesn't really matter. But we'll say if you get outside, you're in the gaseous state. Think about it like at, like at school or something. You get outside the, the building, ah, and everybody just goes wild, you're all spreading out everywhere, running, going home, whatever, going to lunch or whatever it is. It's like a gas. But inside, you come, you're crammed together. Now you're a liquid, okay? Well, here's the thing. It's like saying when you're in equilibrium, if one – first of all, there has to be a reason everybody wants to come in here. I don't know why. They, they want to come. Maybe we have some – you know, amazing demonstrations or chemistry, animal tricks going on, jumping around the room, <laughs> like a zoo. I don't know, a zoo or a circus, whatever, like animal zoo, circus chemistry. What is that? Okay, I think I'll go to that and see. I'm not going to do that, but oh, anyway. Okay, but anyway, so let's just say that everybody wants to come in the room, and the people in the room see it, and they're ready to get out. Okay, okay, it's ready to get out. Everybody crams in. Okay, so every time one person leaves the room they're leaving the liquid state they're becoming a gas but that same moment another person comes in what a weird story i was giving you there so um i guess uh, probably another way uh i saw this one from mr walker at the ap arena saying just say that you have these fish you know the little little fish are in all these tanks here okay and let's just say that there's a tube connecting them and they can swim through it. So every time one goes in this side, let's just say another one goes in. The, oh, I can't do that with this small of a tube. I'll have to make it a bigger tube. So let's just say that every time one fish goes this way, another one goes this way. So they'll, you know, the amounts are staying the same. You know, you have three here. We'll just say on this side, four here. Two are in transit. We'll just we'll count them for now. But three and four. So you're always going to have one. Will, if one goes in here, then one will come out. So you'll have you always have four here and three there. Truthfully, I mean we won't we will we'll just pick one the transit. You'll always have three there and four there. But one will come in, one will go out, one will come in, and that's going on at each equal rates. That forward and backward at the same exact moment. Every time somebody comes in the room, somebody has to go out the room. It's so so saturated inside the room. Okay. All right. Well, back to this. So one more thing to tell you is this. This is the bigger. Here's the, the cool thing. So let's say you really did this. You set your freezer or refrigerator at exactly zero, one atmosphere. You know it's set. You got it ice and water in there. And you could, you'd have to somehow be able to weigh the ice. So I guess you'd have to do that even carefully with the refrigerator and all that. But let's just say you figured out, hey, I've got 100 um, grams of ice. And let's just say that here I have 900 grams of water. So that's like saying, you know, about a, about 1,000 grams, you know, it's about 1,000 milliliters, about one liter is what that would be. So I've got about 900 grams in the, in the liquid state, H2O liquid, and then I have about in the H2O solid state, I've got, what did I say, 100. So 100 grams here and 900 grams in this state. Let's just say you have that. Well, here's the cool thing about it. The law of mass action says 
what, if they're in equilibrium, and these are the amounts that you have of ice and liquid, those amounts will stay constant. So that's really cool. Even though some ice, one molecule melts, but another one freezes on it like on the side. And you can even see this if you've ever seen like a glass of water sitting out for a long time. You had ice in it. You came back later, you noticed the ice was kind of like a different shape. Like it, re, it, it fused together. Well, that's because it froze right around that ice water section. It's going to be zero. And so you can still have freezing and melting going on. So it's kind of neat. Even as, it, as the ice, even if it's not perfect in your room, zero, one atmosphere, you can have a little equilibrium for a while, but as it warms up, it's finally going to all, all the ice will go away. But for, as the ice melts, as time goes by, you know, you'll see that it will, you get a little bit set up, but to be true equilibrium, to, for that forever to go, these numbers are going to be constant at this temperature and that, that pressure. Just like kinetics, the rate is dependent on the temperature. So if you're, as long as you're at that temperature, you'll always have 100 grams in the ice state and 900 in the water liquid state. It's not the best picture in the world for ice water there, but oh well. And, um, and if you came back an hour later or two, or two years later, just the same if nothing could escape from this system, from your refrigerator, it never goes. You could even heat it up. It could go up to five. It could go up hot and then let down to cold, hot, cold. But then when you put it back to this temperature and you wait like whatever, a few hours, it will establish the same equilibrium, 100 in the ice state and 900 in the water. Okay, so that's kind of a neat thing right there. Um, and that's, that's what we mean by equilibrium. Now, chemistry equilibrium, that is called phase equilibrium, what I just showed you. And we talked a little about that in, um, in chapter 10. But chemical equilibrium says the same thing is true for chemical systems. And here's one little example that I gave here, example B with NO2 and N2O4. So NO2 plus NO2 in equilibrium with N2O4. Or the better way to write that, 2NO2 gas turns into N2O4. This is one that we also showed at the AP readiness that um, this gas ha is a reddish brown color. This gas is colorless. So it says, B, example B, imagine that only nitrogen dioxide gas is added into a closed vessel. So in a vessel, all we have is NO2, okay? Now, it's what's reddish brown, this gas. And I've got some around. Do I still have it around? I'll, I'll just show you in class. All right. It says, um, as time goes by, it is allowed to dimerize. The word dimer just means when two things combine to make one molecule. Two, one, a molecule combines with its twin, another one just like itself. That's called a dimer. This is how they really write the reaction. But that's what's going on. Two NO2s are bumping into each other and they're making whatever the mechanism that they're ending up getting that. What will, what will be observed as time passes? As time goes by, well, if you started with only NO2, red-brown gas, the color is going to get, the atmosphere inside that tank is going to get lighter, lighter red-brown, whitish-brown, lighter, 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 lighter. Okay? Two, once the equilibrium is reached, what will be true about the amounts present? They will stay constant. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be 50-50, just like the water and the ice wasn't 50-50. It could be, but it doesn't have to be that way. But we mainly do it by molarity. So the, once you get to equilibrium, whatever the molarity of NO2 is at equilibrium, and then whatever the molarity of N2O4 is at equilibrium, I can just make up some number, 0.100 molar, 0.200 molar, whatever. That, that's just... Now, that would be called the equilibrium position, and we're going to see that later on. In fact, that's right in the next, the next page there. But those amounts are going to stay constant. You still have NO2 turning to N2O4, N2O2, N2O4 decomposing into two NO2s, but these amounts will stay constant, okay? That's what the, just like the little fish example, one fish comes in, one tank A, leaves tank B, it goes to tank A, another one goes the opposite direction. Okay, all right, so I'm trying to use a, 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 a cloth here to try to wipe this off. Okay, now um, chemical equilibrium, and it's, you see down here what's called the equilibrium position. And I have an example here, a reaction of um, N2 and H2 to give you NH3. Um, 
This is an important historical reaction as well to make ammonia. And so you get uh, two of those and you need, yeah, that would balance it out, right? One, two, three. And they're all going to be gases. And so what it just says here is um, the equilibrium position says that once you get to equilibrium, you can measure and say, okay, the N2 is 0.399 molar. The H2 is 1.197 molar. The NH3 is 0.202 molar. If that's true, at that temperature, as long as I keep it at that temperature, you'll always have those same amounts. That's called the equilibrium position. Now, um, equilibrium position in, well, okay, maybe I will write that down as I get into what's going to happen next. N2.399. H2 molarity at equilibrium is 1.197. And then NH3 molarity at equilibrium, it says, is 0.202. Okay, these are going to stay that way as long as they're not affected, not changed, no changes go on, no temperature changes, you don't add any chemicals, take any away, you don't change temperature, you don't change the pressure, that, that's what stays constant, okay? Now, here's a neat thing, at a given temperature, they are going to, um, they're going to, their amounts, well, I guess I have to show you, and I'm going to have to jump ahead to something that we don't see yet. There is something called the equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant. And to write an equilibrium constant, it the constant is a capital letter K. I'm going to, I'm going to go over this in the next lesson. But you actually can just take the molarity of NH3 and use the coefficient 2 squared over the molarity of N2 which will be to the first power, and you, have to, you don't even have to put one, H2 cubed. Okay, well here's the thing that's interesting about this. So this, will their relationships with each other will remain constant. Now, if I were to change the system, if I change the temperature, that's going to change K, just like in, in kinetics. But if I were to put more nitrogen in the system, well, what's going to happen is it will not it will not be in equilibrium. Let's see if I add it has 0.400. See if I put 0.400 more. Okay, at the same temperature, and I close the container. Well, it's not going to change K, but it's going to shift around all these numbers. That number went to 800. Well, that number is going to going to start to react more. That number is going to go up. That's going to go down. All this stuff's going to happen, but K will still end up being the same in the end. So the ratios. This will still be true if I add some chemical if N2 in here, or if I take away some N2, or if I add NH3, or take away NH3 or H2. Yes, it will change these numbers, but they will still change in a way to match that exact ratio. That there, that's a, you'll, you'll shift the position, the equilibrium position, the set of, of values will change, but the number will stay constant. And the scientist that is credited with that and ex explaining that what's going on here I'll say is was named Le Chatelier, Le Chatelier, a French scientist. Okay? And I'm gonna go in a moment and I'm gonna go over that in a second. Um, now let's see some equilibrium con condition. Before I do that, let me say one thing about graphs in equilibrium. And this is in oh I can just jump all the way this is, well, okay, there's one graph on one page that says this, chemical equilibrium graphs. I'm not going to spend much time on this one, but it'll, it'll just say H2O and CO gas react. Now there's a gas to produce H2 and CO2. So what's happening is carbon monoxide gas is being changed to carbon dioxide gas, okay? It's, it's um, the water, carbon, well, carbon, hot, hot water vapor, is, um, how would you say that? Carbon monoxide is pulling an O off of the H. It kind of makes CO2, okay? So your um, CO and your H2O, these are the reactants, and they're going to be decreasing. So notice here you have a curve going down. Like, think about the last chapter, kinetics. You go down. As time goes by the rate, that's how it goes, okay? Well, it goes down. CO and H2O will be overlapping. Maybe the same exact graph there. 
and then the other one is being produced, H2 and CO, because they're all one-to-one -one ratios, you just have two curves there. Um, yeah, well, anyway, what I wanted to show you here is that, look at that line right there, equilibrium. Well, in kinetics, we talked about how these graphs go, but then look at what happens. Then they become straight at the end. Aha! That, that's how, the moment they become straight, that means equilibrium is reached. Equilibrium will only be reached if they're in a closed system at the same constant temperature. Okay, I'm going to explain it more thoroughly on the next example. So you can read about this, about Fritz Haber, a German scientist that won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1918, and he pr produced a process to produce synthetic ammonia, also explosives, unfortunately. Um, the, the ammonia that was used was, was um, the ammonia he produced was able to create um, fertilizers which give us, which allow us today to be able to live on this earth with this many people on earth because we wouldn't be able to do it without fertilizer because of all the agriculture that we have to do, have to have on, on, in the world, the, um, the fertilizer needed for the ground. Well, um, also his, uh, his production of ammonia was used by Germans in World War I to be able to produce explosives and it made it easier for them and they were able to fight and continue on World War I, the battle. Then later, he also um, synthesized some chemicals that were used in chemical warfare really bad. Um, well, anyway, it's sad. So it's like there's some great things about him, some sad things. The, the sad ending of him was that he was a himself, he was Jewish and during World War II when Hitler was, um, you know, the Nazis were taking over and trying to take over everything. He had to flee from Germany he, he, because he was part Jewish. He couldn't, he couldn't be a scientist anymore. He was in, in danger of his life. He had to run away from that. So, But anyway, um, okay, so here I want to show you this graph. In, into, right, here's a little picture of him right there at, at 13.2. And look before that, and there's a graph, and it, it matches this reaction. And it just says, um, as time goes by, notice... Notice the H2 curve. Now, I don't know, can I do this? Let me just try it from here. So notice H2. I'll try to do it. One, two, one, two, three. Let's just say the H2 curve goes down. One, two, three, four, five. Wait. To here. All right, what I wanted to say is that I'll, I'll put it like this half, then a one, then a half, then a whole one, then a half, then a whole one, then a half, and a whole one. So it went down one, two, three, four. Oh, it should have gone five, six down to here. Yeah. Uh oh, it needs to come down to here. Oh, my graph is not doing too great. Got to keep going down. There I am. Okay. All right. So here's the deal. Hydrogen goes down one, two, three, four, five, six little blocks on my little small graph I made here. We'll just say that that's, that doesn't look like it's completely. Okay. So I'm going to change it. Ah. Yay. It looks a little bit better now. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six. It goes down six places. Okay. Now, if nitrogen, and it shows you this in the graph anyway, it starts right about, um, I don't know, I'm going to put it about right here. I'll put it right here. How will, will nitrogen increase or decrease? Well, it's a reactant, so think about kinetics, it's going to decrease. Well, it's going to decrease, but it's going to decrease, its curve will only be one-third the curvature or the slope. You don't really say slope that much, but the slope of the other one. So hydrogen goes down three parts. So we'll call that big, big block one, two, three. This will only go down well one part. Oh, you know what? If I do that, it's gonna it's gonna overlap there. Let's not let's go, we'll just go right here just so it'd be a little bit below it. So it'll go down the equivalent of one big block. So two blocks, but one big one. So it's like from there to maybe there. All right, that will be your nitrogen curve, that will be your hydrogen curve. N2. Hydrogen matches the stoichiometry. And then NH3 is a product, so it starts at zero, and it's going to go up two 
places compared to the nitrogens. So the, the nitrogen went down. Oh, I labeled them wrong. Sorry. Somebody was yelling, Bella, Bella. Okay, hydrogen goes down three places. One, two, three. Six total squares, okay? So I'll just say it went down six squares. So that means it's going to go down, nitrogen is going to go down only two squares because think, look at the ratio, one to three to two. So two to six, and that'll be four. So it should be four squares up from zero. So one, two, three, four. It looks like it's going to go up right about like to there. Now, well, I did not draw this perfectly, but if I had done it, did a little bit better on the graphs here. Equilibrium is the point at which all three lines become straight, completely straight. Looks like on my graph it kind of happens right around, right around here. That one should have been a little bit better, pretty much. And they will stay at those three concentrations. That's your equilibrium position. Of course, this is time, and this is concentration on this side, okay? molarity of what A could be, whichever one you're looking at. Okay, so just know that it, number one says how do the curves for hydrogen and, and ammonia compare? Hydrogen's curve, oh, hydrogen, yeah, and ammonia. Oh, wow, that's kind of strange. Well, you can just say that hydrogen decreases three parts for every two parts ammonia. Or ammonia you know, it's three halves of what the ammonia is. Or ammonia is two-thirds. It it increases, how about ammonia increases at two-thirds the rate that hydrogen decreases? That's a really tough kind of question to answer because I threw a, a, gra um, a fraction in there. Uh, it would have been better to say, how does hydrogen compare to nitrogen? Let me just ask that because that's more likely what, what will be asked. But hydrogen decreases three times as fast as nitrogen decreases. They both decrease, and you see nitrogen goes down, you know, these two parts compared to the six part for hydrogen. Okay, what about ammonia? How is ammonia compared to nitrogen? Well, ammonia increases at two times the rate that nitrogen decreases. So nitrogen decreases one part, but ammonia increases by two parts, okay? One to two. Or in this case, two squares down for nitrogen, but then four squares up for NH3. And yeah, it could be asked the question of number one, Number two is actually the easier question. How does nitrogen and ammonia compare? And I just told you that. So that was there on it. But the first one, how does hydrogen and ammonia? Well, you could say for every three parts that hydrogen decreases, ammonia increases by two parts. That's an easier way to say it. Or you could say ammonia, you know, is two-thirds the rate of what H2 is, 2 over 3. Ah, that's kind of a weird way to do it. All right. So now for Le Chatelier's principle. Now, this is... um. I mentioned it, but then I didn't go through what's going on with the Ch with Chatelier. And here we are. So he says, well, actually, let me read his law, what it says. It says, when stress is imposed on a system at equilibrium, so let's just say that this system is at equilibrium. If I impose stress on the system, and stress could mean it could also mean, it could mean I heat it up. I didn't say anything yet. I just started off with it. It can also mean. Um, it, it could mean you increase the temperature or decrease. And we'll talk more about that in the next lesson. I'll, I'll kind of get into that a little bit more. I don't, know if I'm gonna, I don't know if I'll get that one in this one or, or not. But it could mean I could add some more nitrogen in the system. Or I could add, and I could add, um, you know, you couldn't even imagine that these were the, the numbers at, at this point. I could add more of N. And if I do, it's going to affect the others because the rate this way is going to change. And it will temporarily change or shift the equilibrium position. But then it will come back to equilibrium, as I told you, and you'll get that constant ratio. So um, when stress is imposed on a system, this, the position of the equilibrium will shift in a direction to reduce that stress. That, that's a way to look at it. Okay. And I did a little analogy that I made here called a, like a seesaw. And I said, imagine that the reactants are on one side of the seesaw and the products are on the other side of the seesaw. And if I add weight to this side of the seesaw, uh-oh, to go back to being balanced, I've got to shift some weight over this way and now they'll be balanced again. So, you know, that can really happen. You can have two, two people on a, on a seesaw exactly the same weight. Let's say one person here and they're a perfect twin, same weight on this side. 
Okay, but then another person comes along and you have two on one side and one on the other. Two and one, and they're not in balance. Boom, it goes down. Well, if I shift some of the weight of one person over, they'll go in balance again. Let me show you. You know what? My, um, oh, I do have a piece of, I was trying to see if I have a meter stick, and I don't, but I do have, let me see. This is strange. I do have a piece of, molding that I can use and this this will work this will work out so think of this as being your seesaw if I, I right now it's balanced if I put more weight on this side we're out of balance to get back in balance I've got to shift some material here to the right side and so when I say shift it to the right that means that some of this some of the stuff instead of being in the form of N2 and H2 it's going to switch into the form of NH3 so this part will decrease but this will increase and then they'll have a new equilibrium balance. All right, that's I like to think of it that way. You don't have to, but let me go through the example and, and get it for you. So example A says the effect of changing concentration. It says nitrogen and hydrogen are added to a closed system. All right, this is it in a in the presence of a catalyst. Um, equilibrium is reached. Predict the direction of the shift of the equilibrium position in response to each of the following changes. So one says, what if we were to add more nitrogen gas? Okay, number one. So if they're in balance, if I add more nitrogen, okay, boom, they're out of balance. This side's too heavy. This becomes heavier. Add more nitrogen. Now, what's, to get to equilibrium now, it's going to have to, the system must shift to the right. It's going to have to shift some weight, some, well, some molecules over to the right. Now, the real explanation is this. If I have more, if I have nitrogen gas and I have hydrogen gas inside a tank, I should have used different colors, but oh well. I don't know if you can't really see it with the colors as much. But I have these gases inside. All right, well, let's just think of it that way. I mean, really, you have all of these in one tank. But but let's just say, this, let's just focus on this side for a minute. You have all these in this side, in right here now. Now, and they can, and they can be, yeah, we could have a tube. But that's not going to be really true to put a tube and put this side with this ammonia. The truth is they're all mixed together in one container. But if I had these in this side, if I add more nitrogen, N2, 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 guess what? Remember last chapter, kinetics? If you increase more nitrogen, are you going to cause the reaction between these two rate to increase or decrease to the same? Well, having more, more collisions, more molecules to collide with, it's going to increase it. And so it's going to, this is now going to go faster. So if I add more nitrogen for a moment, I'm going to have a faster rate in the top and a slow rate on the bottom. They're not going to be equilibrium in rates anymore, just for temporarily. So if I add more nitrogen, here's the easy way. Add more nitrogen, it's out of balance. So they're going to react more and more and more faster, and they're going to start to shift. and make As they react, they're going to make more and more and more ammonia, and more ammonia will be made, and so now it comes back into balance, okay? It, so this number one, the system, the the system would say the system must shift will will shift right toward the product toward the next three um, to reach equilibrium. Well, actually, I'll, I'll just, it's better to say this. I, no, no, no. The system will shift to the right. Once you get to equilibrium, the position, the, the, you can set the equilibrium position, or the position will shift to the right. And what that means in chemistry is this is going to be increased, that's going to be decreased, and that's going to also be decreased. Now, that'll be, since you added more nitrogen, this is going to be higher than it was, but it's still going to go down from that initially adding it, it's going to go down, some of it will go down. I add a bunch of nitrogen, it's going to go down. So it'll be a little bit higher than it was, but that's going to go down. And that's going to go up. Okay, number two. What if you add more ammonia? So get to my little thing again. So now, this, is, this ought to be easy. So if I add more ammonia, up, oh, we're out of balance. So now to get to equilibrium, the reaction this, this way is going to, have to go, going to go faster. So it's going to shift to the left. The system will shift to the left. All right? Shift. The system shifts left. Okay? Sorry. Okay? Um, and then three says, what if we remove some hydrogen, not all of it? Yeah, you could, you could actually, you could remove all of it. 
if I remove hydrogen from the system, okay, well, then again, think about that. Here's your balance, um, your, your, uh, your seesaw. Take this away. Like, you ever did that with somebody? You're on a seesaw, and then your other friend, is, you know, brother or sister, oh, they jumped off, and boom! Then you just fell down, ah! And you hurt your little bottom on the ground there. Okay, so if you take this out, now to get to equilibrium, it will shift to the left again. But replacing this, it's going to replace, this is going to, this can't react anymore, or at least it can't react as fast. If there's no, if there's no hydrogen, it can't react at all. So only that reaction is going to be prevailing more and more and more to, to, um, to replenish that. And this one is going to end up being lower than it was, and that's going to end up being higher than it was. That one will probably end up being lower than it, than it was before you took it away. So whatever I have right now, if I take it all away, when it gets replenished, it won't be that high again. That'll be higher, and that'll be lower, though. So it, anyway, it shifts. This time we said left. Okay. Let me go to the next mega problem, and I'll make it a mega, an example B, with sodium chloride adding, added to a, a, clo a, a closed container there. All right, so these, hopefully this is kind of fun. You'll like it. Le Chatelier, Le Chatelier, okay? And it says sodium chloride solid changing into sodium ion. Oh, so we're just going to be melting in chloride ion. Not melting. Not melting. Dissolving in water. Sorry about that. I was thinking that it's not liquid. It's, a, it's melting. It's dissociating. So it's in water. So, okay. There's a little bit more to this one, but I'll, I'll try it. We'll see. If we hit it, we'll hit it, and we'll come back to it later. All right. Is the equilibrium going to shift left or right? After that shift, what will happen? Will it increase, decrease, or no change for the things that are in the right column? So sodium chloride added to water and to form a saturated solution. Now, this is also important. If you add salt in the water, you know, it will dissolve. You'll have Na plus, Cl minus, Na plus, Cl minus. Okay, you keep getting that as you sprinkle the salt, add more and more. Well, how do you know what is saturated? Saturated means it is, there is so salty the water, there's so much NaCl dissolved that no more can dissolve anymore. It is the saltiest water possible. If you were to drink it, I don't know why I did that, but if you were to drink that, it, look, it's the saltiest water possible at that temperature. Now, if I added, how would you know you got to a saturated solution? So in a saturated solution, it means that if I add more salt, guess what it does? If it's already saturated, it just goes down to the bottom. It will not dissolve anymore. So if you stir it up forever, in a long, uh, forever, for a long, long, long time, and finally you keep adding salt, and no more will, will, will dissolve. You see the salt building up at the bottom. Then you know that the liquid above it is saturated. Okay? Uh, you know that when you have salt left over. If you don't see salt on the bottom, then you can always add more. So it's saturated. To be in equilibrium, when you have um, when you have a solid in equilibrium with the with the um, with the dissolved ions, uh, you have to have a saturated solution. This we actually will talk about in a later chapter, the next chapter. But I'm gonna, uh, but Le Chatelier, I'm gonna put a little bit right here. All right. So it says, what if I remove some Cl negative? So here we go. If number one, if we remove Cl negative ion, okay, there, it, boom, it falls down. So it will shift to the right. Okay. So number one. What will it shift left, right? Equilibrium position will shift to the right. And then as a result, Na plus concentration, when it when it restores to its new equilibrium, okay, now new equilibrium values, sodium, how will it be compared to what it started? It will be higher than it was. It will go up. It will be, have been increased. Okay? Number two, if we add more in a cl solid if you i just told you a moment ago if i add more what this is going to fall down to the bottom and build up and nothing changes so no effect it has no effect and so what about the cl concentration it stays same no change or you put no change if you want to put that number three um what if we increase the temperature okay now this is kind of the next section I was going to talk about, but I can I guess I'll throw it in here as well. It says here that 
this becomes more soluble. More of it will dissolve as temperature goes up. So if I add heat, more will dissolve. So actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll expand on this in a later lesson as well, but if I add, it tells you it's an endothermic reaction. So in other words, you heat, adding heat as a reactant causes it to shift to the right, okay? So adding more heat. So anyway, I just said that, so it will shift right. Because it's endothermic, it will shift to the right. And, they, and because they said it, solubility increases with heat. The, the real word, the real answer is to say that means it's endothermic. It will shift right. And then it says what will happen to the Cl concentration negative? It will go, it will increase. Okay? Number four, what if we decrease the temperature? Well, that's a strange one. I know you think, well, decrease would have to mean the opposite. It will shift back that way. I didn't really show you there, but adding heat, think about that. Boom. You're out of balance. Adding heat. Now it's going to have to shift to the right to get back into equilibrium. If you if you decrease temperature, you're taking away the heat, okay? So now it'll have to shift to the left, okay? So it shifts to the left to reach equilibrium. And then it says the mass of NaCl solid. If it shifts to the left, the mass of that solid will increase. All right, the mass of that will increase if it shifts to the left, okay? All right, the part that is not dissolved. It will precipitate. You can also say it that way. It, some NaCl will precipitate from being dissolved it, out of the solution. No more can be dissolved there. All right. Um, wow, there are a couple more. You know what? I'm probably going to have to make another part. I guess I am. This is a very long one. Uh, so I'm going to make a part two of this video for you. This is a, this would be a long section. Because I have to, something else i got to work on right now. But um, yeah, wow, I didn't know there were three more. But then we'll do all of the Chatelier. So this will have part one. It'll be a part two. All right, I'll see you.